I met Charlotte this summer. Um, by a <coughs> surprise trip, I ended up going to New Orleans, and I was able to go to uh, the Joan Mitchell has a foundation there and a studio program, which is really wonderful. And um, I attended those studios, and I met Charlotte. So it was, um, and I had known of her work and so forth. And I thought, oh, it was so great <coughs> for her to come to Lima. So let me just say, I'm going to go a little bit through her uh, bio with you. So Charizade Garcia is an interdisciplinary artist. She has a BFA from Parsons, the New School, and an MFA from the City College of New York. So fellow CUNY alum, which I love to see. Um, she's a 2015 Joan Mitchell Foundation grant and is the co-founder for the Dominican New York Proyecto Grafica and sits on the advisory board of No Longer Empty. She has participated in the S-Files Biennial and the Fourth Caribbean Biennial, the Havana Biennial, and other major international venues. Garcia has exhibited widely with pro projects such as Supertropics, Paradise Redefined, Theories of Freedom, This Side of Paradise that No Longer Empty, Stories of Fallen Angels, and many, many more. Her work is in the permanent collection of the Smithsonian Art Museum, El Museo del Barrio, the Hasatanic Museum, the Museo de Arte Moreno de Santo Domingo, and private collections. Her personal papers are in the collections of the Archives of American Art at the Smithsonian Institution. Her latest public commission by Columbia University, The Liquid Highway, is on view until June 2016 at Miller Theater, might have been in the past, but yes. okay. <laughs> Garcia is currently represented by Lyle Oren Reitzel Gallery in Santo Domingo and New York. She is a faculty member um, of Parsons School of Design. And I want to say that she's currently um, completing a large commission at BRIC, which is the Brooklyn, what is the good for that? It's the media, media House. The Media House. and. Um, I wanted to pass this around, so the opening is coming up pretty soon. There's a lot of information, and this has um, conferences on uh, contemporary Dominican, Haiti, and their April 4th. April. April 4th. So there's a number of things on here, so I'm going to pass those around. I'm also going to pass around um, a couple of her cards with her information, her website, you can follow the commission on Instagram as I've been. It looks really exciting. So um, with that, I'm thrilled to invite and welcome Cheryl Slavik. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invite, Jonathan and Daniel. Um, I love to come to uh, Lehman College. Um, I have uh, Actually, I'm very sentimental with this space. Uh, it was one of my favorite, favorite shows, basically, um, of mine. Um, I was invited. Um, I mean, I came here in the last century with other shows, and somehow I kept coming here. And um, then I, I was invited to do a solo show. And the solo show, uh, it was Paradise Redefined in 2006. And from there on, I feel I am completely connected to this place. So it is for, really for me a pleasure to be here and, and being and have the opportunity of sharing my, my, my work, you know, and my many theories with you. Um, I am from the Dominican Republic. I was born in Santo Domingo, the capital. And then I came to New York to uh, continue my studies at Parsons. Now, uh, not only I met my husband there, but I also, uh, I am faculty there. And I uh, never thought that that would happen, but I fell in love with New York. And when they ask me, where are you from? I, I cannot help it, but I say I am Dominican New York. <laughs> because I had to be loyal to two sides of my story. And you're going to see that a lot in my work. Uh, even the title of, the, of this presentation is uh, a little bit of always. It's uh, always this need I have to make sure, you know, I, I tell you about my past because my past completely informs my present and it's, it's going to always give me the clues for whatever I'm going to do in the future. For me, it's super important. I cannot leave anything behind and, and I love and celebrate the fact that there are many layers to my skin. And I am always 
like open to kind of uh, discover new layers. Um, one thing that is key in so much of uh, what I do is uh, that life that I have, that it feels that it's a little bit here and there. I, I, I feel that home is way, um, you know, the geography of home is way, is extended to me. This, uh, this idea that I come from an island and then I migrated to another island, it, it is always in my work. Um, I, I always been inspired by history. And I come from a family that uh, was very political. Um, I have writers, my father is an artist, my mother in theater, my sister is an artist as well. And so there was, there is so many things that when, if you pay attention to the, the symbols of my work, you can decode that they still live there. Uh, I love theater. I, one of my problems is that I love everything. And, and how to be okay with that. Every time you go to a school, it's like, oh no, you have to focus in this, you have to focus in that. And I am very rebellious. The moment that you start telling me these kind of rules is when I decided that that was the only way. Well, that sometimes was great, that sometimes was a problem. But I guess I love the challenge, and that challenge and being rebellious in that way have helped me, you know, to find my voice and to be true to myself and my history of the many layers. So I'm going to start with a piece that is from uh, 1998. And it was, um, uh, it was titled Endless Love. And it's a whole migration story uh, series and, uh, from that time. Uh, during that time, um, it, it was, I, I am very much, um, I am one of those artists, like I said before, I am very much into history. And I love to read anything that has to do with what's happening before, what was happening and what's happening now. So I was listening to the news. And that happens a lot to me, because I read a lot, but the way that I research is like I, I, I read a lot of stuff, but then I love to actually go and talk to people. And then uh, at that time, it was all this uh, news about the Cubans uh, closing, you know, to go to uh, Florida. And the same thing happened in my Dominican Republic of the Dominicans going to Puerto Rico. And then if you really start paying attention, you know, and no just believing the, the TV that we, you know, the information we get, you see that that happens everywhere. And we just go to the Mediterranean and it's still happening. And I thought, my God, you know, I am so connected to this whole idea of crossing the liquid masses, the liquid borders, that eventually I will call the liquid highway. But at that time I was not calling that the liquid highway. I was thinking about this need to cross that, uh, that, that, that obstacle of the, the water. So then I start um, using that story as my inspiration. And there was a moment that I said, okay, enough information, enough blah, blah, blah. Let me just get the marriage between my brain and my guts. And then that's why I start making things. And, and I start doing all these, these uh, drawings. I start always with drawings. Drawings, drawings is like for me like writing. That's my first step. But these drawings can become paintings, can be, they can become installations, they can become animated videos, they can become many things, depending on you know, what I want to be talking about or how I feel that it will be more effective uh, to, uh, for my narrative. So I start doing all these things in pink. And I'm going to tell you why pink was my thing. Not only I have a background in fashion, that's how I got my, my visa, my job visa. When I graduated Parsons, I needed to work full time to be able to justify that I want to stay in this country. To be a fine artist was an issue, especially because you would go to work with these big deal professors or um, than well established artists, and to be a woman was not very kosher. It was hard because they, they will make you feel like, you know, you were like a wallpaper, you know, or you were like, oh, how hard, caramba, so sad, you are a woman, you're not gonna make it in, the, in, the, in this art. Because that's the attitude to put you down. But the thing is that, you know, I am very rebellious, like I said. <laughs> so I decided that, you know, I was going toward fashion and I was lucky uh, to be, um, to have some experience in textile design. I started working in a couture textile uh, for 
very um, known designers. And then I start really talking about and experiencing the politics of color. You know, how we sell the grays, the browns, the reds, and then the pink. Oh, the pink. Oh, the little girl, you know, they love that. They love that. And every time I thought about the pink, so fuchsia and so strong and so flamboyant, why does it have to mean something weak or fragile? So then I decided, well, this is the way. The way that I engage is by thinking, making people think that this is only beautiful. Let me, let me use that color that it means weak to talk about things that are heavy. So I was talking about migration. The only way to involve and engage, engage people to serious business is by making them think that it was something easy. So that's why I started using pink. And then I started building up all these sculptures that were like, like the inner tubes, the ones that they float when you go to the beach, those ones that the Cubans were using to go to Florida, and the ones that Dominicans were using to go to Puerto Rico, both communities trying to go to USA. And the reason I start, um, I went from the floaties, the normal floaties with the pink, and using wooden materials and making it like almost like drawings with the uh, little pieces of wood, it was because, you see how Pinocchio wanted to be a boy? Well, my inner tubes wanted to be a boat. So I start playing with that idea of like, I want to be to be able to survive. So my inner tubes, my floaties that were so beautiful in a swimming pool, well, salvation objects for other people. Then, using um, also this idea of, uh, like I was saying to you, to, to you before, about the pink, making things very, you know, attractive. Um, I also started using the politics of size. And to call attention, and then when you really got into it, you realize we were talking about salvation and things that were serious. I also um, use uh, this life vest, and I made sure they, they, ha they, ha they have drawings, but in, in my mind was tattoo. Tattoos of these iconic um, angels that come directly from the Catholic heritage of the Caribbean, but I will always make them darker. Always give them that paint of like, to make sure I will not leave Africa behind. Okay, you, you want to conquer, colonize with religion? So we're gonna give you religion, we're gonna hack you. And the religion is gonna become more colorful because it's the American experience. You can transplant from Europe, but you're gonna get American when you come here. So I start like doing those little tick, tick, tick of like making everything almost very classic, playing with the idea of uh, something very Renaissance-like, very sweet, very angelic, but with a lot of, of that heavy history behind. That piece, by the way, I saw that piece after 13 years. It's part of the museum, uh, the collection of the Museo del Barrio. It's fine out at, uh, uh, in the exhibition at, um, it's, the exhibition is called Queenie. In Spanish, it would be like Reinitas. <laughs> which I think is very funny. And uh, it's a um, women uh, in the collection of El Museo, and it's uh, at Hunter East, uh, the uh, East Gallery, East, East Art Gallery in uh, 129th Street. So pass by because it's, uh, there are many great pieces. I am very honored to be part of that group of women at the exhibition. So that's also Endless, endless Love and uh, is um, also part of the migration series, 1998. Then I keep working with, um, like I said before, uh, many of the, the way that I research is not only by reading or going to exhibitions, but it's so much about talking to people and engaging with people. And I like to say also witnessing things, like, uh, like really paying attention, but I do feel that to witness things is not enough. Like you have to get involved. So in 2003, I went to uh, some of the areas in Dominican Republic where they have this, what we call uh, illegal airports. And these illegal places, what they do, 
you know, they don't, so many people don't, they, 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 get, they don't get visas to go to this country, of course, because they don't, they can, you know, what, what they have, they cannot sustain their living here. So they, what they do is that they go to these places in the, in the coast of the, uh, is the, uh, is the uh, basically east, northeast, that is very close to Puerto Rico. And there are these people that have a business where they um, organize these trips. And these boats are boats that are in bad conditions. And if you, know, if you are inventing, you can get 10 people in one of those boats. What they manage to get inside those boats, 50 people. 50, imagine that. And every person most likely pay like $1,000 to $1,500. And the accidents are every week there is an accident. And how do we know there is an accident? Because with the helicopters, you can see how to, uh, there is a canal, Canal de la Mona, that actually divides Dominican Republic from, from Puerto Rico. It gets bloated, full of blood. Because that area is infected by sharks. It's a canal. So it's like food and garbage and all that. So, um, if there is a bad movement, and if there are so many people in one boat, you know, if us, you know, forget it. There is meat for the, for the shark. So that happens a lot. And uh, so I went there to this, um, to this uh, town, it's called Sabana de la Mar. Sabana de la Mar is the, pl is the, is the place, uh, like, a, like everybody knows, you know, there is, a, there is a, like a, there is an underground business and everybody seems to be part of, it's like the mafia there. And I stayed there for a week. It's very much like a ghost town. You know, a, like everybody, they, you can see that people don't really talk to you and they sincere. Well, they thought I was from, from the CIA. Imagine that. And according to them, my accent was not Dominican. <laughs> so, see how suspicious they were? I was like, it was really interesting because it's like, I usually very good at connecting. And for me, it was like a job to connect because it was like this business. And for example, I got these captains from the, uh, from these, uh, the, the people that organized these trips, that basically they were kind of making me feel uncomfortable because there was a lot of tension. But at the end of the day, you know, by the day number three, these younger people start talking. And it seems that everybody in that town, a little town, everybody had somebody that either died in, in the process of going to Puerto Rico, or like this kid over here, uh, that basically, and another one that you're gonna see at the end, that basically they actually, they travel back and forth, like it's like, like an airport. And or, or some people, they leave used by the father and some people come from there and they bring money, that kind of thing. So it became super interesting. And what I did was that I made like a, a factory in the middle of the um, beach where they usually um, organize the trips and they leave the part from there. Um, a, a factory of lightsabers. And the lightsabers that I, um, that I made, were they, I, I used the, you know that, uh, the coolers, the coolers for the beer. In Dominican Republic, sometimes there, there's no electricity in some of these towns. But somehow, they always have court beer. <laughs> mystery, a mystery. But you can see the priorities. <laughs> so anyway, so I decided that that's something that floats. So I said, well, let me find things that are from the town, so no, you don't have to buy it someplace. And I use uh, the pink, I use and I install, uh, it was from um, Umbrella Fabric. So I went to all those weird places and you know, like you find a lot of stuff. And then I use Umbrella Fabric and to, uh, to make these uh, lightsabers to kind of prevent some of the accidents or at least to talk about the dangers of the journey. And then uh, what I did for a uh, performance and, and to also to build up the conversation, it was like I would design this, um, uh, drawings on top of the a light vest. When they told me a story, I basically kind of mark the their lightsabers with their old stories, but visually. So if you can, if you go to my website, you can see the entire video. But you can see how one thing goes from drawing to installations to a sculpture and then to a performance video. 
Then, this is 2004 and 6, and I tell you why, because that's when I start working on Paradise Ready Fine. As, like I said before, I am very much fascinated by, I love history, but I am also fascinated by the history of Las Americas. And I am, of course, you know, always, like I said before too, in love with New York and the history of this, this city and, and the connection with the history of the Caribbean, you know, which basically, you know, it is the root of what we call America. And we're the first place of like when people start thinking about, you know, this whole concept of the American dream. It was something that was, you know, as early of 1492, when the first Spaniards came to, uh, to, uh, to the settlement in, in Santo Domingo. Santo Domingo in that time was not Santo Domingo, it was Quisqueya. And I really um, start paying attention to the, uh, a community that I am part of, that is the Dominican community in New York. My experience, I realized, you know, was, was very different than many of the Dominicans that came in the 80s and late 80s. You know, I came to study here. So I went directly to the village, you know, cannot be more downtown artist, Hosoho kind of vibe. But during my, my first years in New York, I, I met a lot of Dominicans and the Dominicans would go and live in Washington Heights. Washington Heights became the place that I would go if I want to get those Dominican things. And, 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 and I was fascinated by the way, um, you know, people adapt and how the, 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 the city is the city we love because all the flavors of all these people. And also how it's also always evolving. Like I started thinking about and reading about that area before the Dominicans came, you know, Jewish, Germans, you know, the Cubans were there first and then the Dominicans and the, the African American were side and the Puerto Ricans were in the East Harlem. And how, and then the Italians as well with the Puerto Ricans. And how all that shaped the flavor of the city. But it's always changing, it's always changing. So, um, because I want to preserve and understand the community, I start like going for like two years uh, to really go to the restaurants and ask people, what were the expectations when they came to this city? And 95% of the Dominicans and, and the uh, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans and, and Cubans that I met in Washington Heights, they would say, well, you know, the Cubans were like, well, you know what, this is too cold. The moment I am tired, I go to Florida. The Dominicans have the issues of the passport and the visa and all that jazz. And then they go like, well, you know, I'm going to come, I, you, that was my idea, to come to New York because I have, they always have an aunt, you know, always an aunt or an uncle. And I'm going to work for 10 years, I'm going to go and leave, I go back to Santo Domingo, to Santiago. And it was always like that, this idea that they were going to go back. And then I said, so what, what happened? Are you, are you almost done here? Oh, no, no, no. There was a, a, a couple that I love. Oh, well, you know, we went back to Santiago. We bought a house, make an enormous house. And now we are back here because we got bored. We, we understood that now New York became our city. So, I, but, you know, inspired by all these stories, I started building up uh, these drawings. And the Dominican York, this one here, is one of the characters. Um, it was, again, using the Catholicism. All those, uh, so many of the apartments, 98% of the apartments, first thing you see is a Jesus Christ in the middle of the living room. So, yeah, the colonization really was effective. So you can see, uh, you know, uh, the, the Catholic iconography. So I, I started replacing that with these black angels. These black angels that I, I, I like to, um, my characters, I know because they're African-American. It is because I, my work is about the politics of inclusion. And I tell you what, when you mix all the colors in a palette, when you are, you know, when you're a little in, in, our, in our school or in, in a school, and, and you know, they ask you, some of the students, they ask you, Ay, how can I make brown? It's the best answer ever. What, everything that you see there, just mix it together. And that is the option of inclusion. 
So since I, since I want to tell the stories of all of us, not only of the Dominicans, all, all of us, then I had to make my brown. So my brown includes the history of all of us and somehow we connected by living in this city. Then I decided that, well, I had to use some of the symbols to locate this character at this moment. And then that's why I started using the necklaces of the, the, uh, the plantain um, tree and the, uh, and the uh, golden um, uh, airplane. Because that's one of the things that you see a lot, is this, ne this need to, you know, to show that things are great in the new land. So I start using all that. But I also start using, uh, this, both of them are part, these drawings are 22 by 30, paintings on paper, and they are part of an animated video. And this animated video, this one here, is called La Gloriosa. La Gloriosa, what it does is the glory times. It is a, a kind of locates like a timeline for my exhibition. It was uh, to, to kind of start, what, when was that first group of Dominicans that came to this city? What was the exodus, the first exodus? It was exactly before the, the killing and the assassination of the dictator Trujillo. And they, the kind of a migration that came from Santo Domingo was a intellectual, because as you know, you can see it right now in this country, the first thing that they hate is people with knowledge. They had to keep you, you know, quiet. So many of the people that came from, at that time, 1963, 1959 to 63, uh, it was the time of Trujillo, it was very uh, bloody, bloody times of the dictatorship, uh, came to this country. So I wanted to make sure I would make a symbol of that uh, exile, the political exile. After that, I, uh, you, you could go inside this gallery and it was full of tents. And these tents were completely um, basically made by um, collages of the uh, of photographs of Washington Heights. But the Washington Heights that, and, and, that I have, I will you know, make graffiti of the plantains, of memories, of saints, and I will, I will make like almost paintings of these tents. But these tents also, when you walk around, they have light inside and each one had an interview. I started recording my interviews with people because it was, for, for me, it was a way to engage not only my inspiration, but also to engage the public that came. And then also I used the, again, the idea of the, uh, of the ocean, or the ostaco, and in this case also, or the via, you know, to get a better life. That was paradise redefined. So then, uh, I mean, in between that piece and this piece, there are many, but I want to show you how my interest in the history of this, of, of, of this country, the history of our continent, and, um, and basically my fascination with history and how to re rewrite the history. And what I love about also, uh, well, I am a storyteller, and I love the fact that if we can, of, like when you have a sentence and you, you kind of put something, a, a subject before, you know, or after, it completely changes the meaning. In math, it's two plus two is always four, you know. But in, when you're talking, you know, if something got killed first, first it's not going to be the same if it got, it got killed after. It, it really changes and gives you uh, so many choices for different narratives. So I, I, I love stories because they, they an endless source of inspiration for me. So the whole thing with a Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island and all that, fascinating for me, fascinating. So I got this commission. Uh, it was the Notre Dame University in uh, Indiana. And they, they were doing this uh, Latino conference and it was all about um, the state of the union. And I started playing again with the idea in this time of my, um, my super inclusive Statue of Liberty, and I call it, uh, if you told the talk, you had to walk the walk. And so the Statue of Liberty had to change colors to be more inclusive. And it will, you know, I made the, uh, the whole um, um, uh, golden um, geography of the United States of the place, the promised land. This time, no New York, <laughs> this time is the entire nation. And then I play with the uh, collages of um, the dollar to kind of allude 
to the danger of the economy and, and, the, and the too much money. And you can see how that's, that's a very big piece, but also you can see how I work, um, I, I make a lot of sketches first, and, and that kind of like take me to, uh, to uh, a final piece. But my, my, um, my enjoyment of for this is like, I could go so many ways, and that's why I do so many sketches, because I think it's like, give it more and more pieces to the, uh, to the story. So, as I was saying before, I could go, and, and I love, you know, to, uh, to be also very baroque in the, uh, and I embrace it, you know, with the, uh, the, me the, the different mediums I use, but also the many layers of the colors that I, I wear. And in this case, this is a project called Theories of Freedom. And this was at Long Island University and Staten Island College. And also, um, it was a solo show at um, a City College. So this one, Theories of Freedom, and I start using the inner tubes. In this time, the flow this, uh, became like this, um, I stacked them together. I like to say that I dipped them in gold. And everything was alluding to the idea of uh, a history of this continent and it was basically a, a dream of business and richness. So it's looking for gold, then basically um, a conquering and colonizing with um, religion, and then uh, having all this idea of freedom. If you see uh, the Statue of Liberty in this case is a Dora, the Explorer, but upside down on top. So it's always, there is always in all my pieces something that, that is, is, is about beautiful and fun, but always there is a sadness as well. And the way that I attach these in, golden inner tubes, deep in gold, as I, like, as I like to say, it was using the electrical tides that are used by the immigration police anywhere in the planet. They use this... Uh, you see, when you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, they have these, um, these electrical ties that are used for uh, plumbing. That's what they use, basically, to, uh, to really uh, take people that are illegal. So I, I alluding to that, you know, I, I connect all that with that ties, and some of them were very tight, like talking about the struggle, and some of them were softer, you know, um, alluding then to a softer and easier journey. Then another one was almost a blue painting using uh, different blue inner tubes and floats I found. Many of them were covered by blue, by, I, I made paintings in blue, and then I print them, and I use print a lot, I, look, I use print making a lot, but the way that I use print making is, um, this is what I use printmaking. I, um, I love the fact that there is, the, the printmaking is a very democratic practice. You know, you can repeat the same image. So that will, that's perfect for people that want to actually collect because then it's less money, you know. But, uh, but my, my thing is, is, what I love is the fact that we can repeat this image over and over, yet there is always something different about it. So I, Love that because then I cut it and then I make that repetition that basically I want to talk about there is something in common to the history of us, yet it's unique of each one of us. So then I kind of contradict and play with the idea of democracy. And so, okay, so you can see that that's um, a landscape, that landscape of paradise, that one. And then that one you cannot see from there, but you're gonna see in the next, in the next uh, picture, um, that it has these tags. These tags that say uh, John F. Kennedy, Airport, because that's the, uh, the promised land of our times. And unfortunately, I realized I didn't, I didn't uh, show that photo, but there is a Statue of Liberty that is part of the tag because it, I want to make sure, you know, it is the land of uh, the lady that embraces us all. And in part of that distribution as well, and in that group of series, is like the sea of wonder, well, it's, it's gray. And again, I think about the politics of color. Um, I'm always thinking about this idea that nothing is black 
all is white. There's so, may, so much gray in between. Nothing is an absolute truth. And the more and more I study the case of things, everything is more relative. So then I, I, this whole idea of doing my, my enormous um, ocean, you know, in gray, it has to do once again, you know, using the printmaking, repeating the same image, then coding the image, building a unique piece, you know, where the, the history is ours, but it's a little bit unique for each one of us. And also the, I make installation and I, or sometimes I, I do the graf, like graffiti, like drawings, uh, you know, to, uh, to go with the sculptures and you can see here clearly the electrical tights. And many times in my exhibitions, the exhibitions are, they, the pieces can live by themselves, but I, how I think is like to, make, to, to, to engage you as an entire universe. For me, it's very important to create a, uh, a ambience. It's so one another, another uh, element that than sometimes I add to my cathedral. This is the, this inner tube uh, with the, the uh, Gordon Cathedral. It is, um, it is also, it's, it's like a uh, floating universal altar. So what I also do is that I invite people in the show to uh, post um, on the sculpture um, their own story of migration. So they will post it and then they become very pregnant by the history of us. This is one of the invitations for all the shows and I use the three colors, red, yellow and blue to simplify my life with the idea that, that that's the roots of everything. And that's like completely graphic design. <laughs> but I enjoy it a lot. And then just like that, I also, um, I paint, paint a lot. And I, like I said, I use a lot of uh, printmaking and, and I love to play with, I love to play with big machines, like those inkjet machines, big things, you know, to uh, kind of play around with that. I had these pieces um, um, in 1996 that I was using, I was painting on top of tapestries. And it was because I want to colonize the colonizer. So I would do all these very Caribbean things on top of very European fabric. Now, in 1915, 2015, 1915, 2015, <laughs> A while ago, yes. <laughs> um, basically, I decided to, um, to go pink again and to print those fabrics and then start uh, uh, painting um, these um, blonde mulatas, the blonde mulatas. It's a lot of talking about diversity in this country and everywhere. And I, I you know, I, I, as much as I am, obviously, you know, very political and I, and I love the whole diversity thing. I, I hate to kind of like, it's always about these things, about like so almost like it become dogmatic, the whole thing of diversity and democracy. And then, then you see how everything falls apart in a second, you know? And, and then I just really paying attention to the beauty, the beauty of these crazy outcomes. You know, of these people that, that go to places that supposedly are super exotic, but they, this is what we are in these in this, uh, Las Americas. And then I, I start looking at all these combinations we have, like these uh, uh, African Americans with the blue eyes, you know? These, um, these Latinas that are like, they don't, they don't have to be blonde, but they dye their hair blonde, you know? And all that kind of beauty that breaks with the, uh, the, the concept of what is beautiful. And that's what I want to embrace and that's what I start doing. All my, uh, my mulatas blown, as I call it. And I, again, I, I place them with my inner tubes. I use a lot uh, the idea of Disney as a religion icon uh, because in, it's, it's also a great colonizer, TV. And Disney cannot be more perfect, you know, especially in Latin America, you could see that it goes the, the Disney goes perfectly with Catholicism because it's all about these things that are, are completely heroes. They become symbols of like um, a, in a world art all the time, something that people desire, uh, things that represent uh, greatness. 
and they all at the same level, which I find extremely interesting, contradictory, and extremely baroque. So I use it. This, in this case, my mulata, my blonde mulata here, uh, she's uh, in the ocean, but she has necklaces with the Statue of Liberty and a little angels. Is also trying to find, you know, uh, salvation by making sure she can float in this highway, liquid highway, as I like to call it, that is an obstacle and is also a via. And then this is a, a, one of my projects, uh, my, my commission at, at um, Columbia University, that was called the Liquid Highway. And uh, that was the time I just uh, did not include any figure, but just energy, the energy of the line, you know, my, um, the politi politics of color, and movement. And it was all also, this was all painting, but the other ones were uh, pre-making. I, I was still self-screening the detri to the walls, and it was all that about, I was talking about a novel version of that um, a gray ocean, yes. Oh, thank you. Almost, almost there, I am fine, I'm doing fine. <laughs> Another photo. What? Uh, Columbia University. It was for a year. It was a commission for a year. Now there is another one at Brick, 80 De Calp Avenue. Um, I will maybe send the information so you guys can pass by. I just finished it yesterday and it's going to be for the year. That is also another version of the Liquid Highway. This was at um, um, uh, New Orleans big paintings all about uh, America. And the exhibition was called It's So Sunny That It's Dark. And it's all about the idea that America and high now is all stripes and stars. And fireworks, that's what I like to say, fireworks. This is also from New Orleans, inspired by the idea of resistance of the uh, Three women of color, then start uh, by law, they had to use the tignon or the headdress. And then the, uh, the pure Europeans uh, decided that they looked too beautiful and they wanted to use it as well. But the law was for the mulatas to use it. So that became a resistance piece for the women, for the women of color. Stripes and fireworks. As you can see, the sort of iconography, the appearance of angels, and, but also with this um, contradiction of something very playful when I am talking about something very dark. Views of those exhibition of Is So Sunny That Is Dark. That's one of the lightsabers um, that I actually uh, had as a souvenir from that performance in 2003. The tale of this piece that was at the uh, Pacific Standard Times, the exhibitions from the Getty in Los Angeles. This just finished this past January. And it's gonna come to Sugar Hill Museum, that piece, uh, in two months. So that's it, we keep it there. Lightsabers because I, am, I come from an island, you know, so and I moved to another island. So the water is always there. And in reality, if you listen to the history of us, you know, we are who we are because somebody decided to, to cross those uh, liquid highways. And then I was always thinking that I need something to float. You know, these floating devices were very important in my imagination all the time. So they became like a very important uh, element in everything I do. Also, water carries our DNA. Um, I well, you didn't talk about any of the influences um, on your work, either methods, iconography. Can you say a word about that? Oh, well, yes. My, my work is very much inspired by it, uh, 
history, like I said, but Baroquism, the Baroque movement, uh, as I, I like to transplant uh, the Baroquism from Europe to what happened here and how I see it that makes so much sense that it's so different from, like I am thinking right now, you know, the Baroque in Italy was completely different to the Baroque in Italy also, but in Venice, because the light. The moment the Baroque came here, it became completely different. Be so no, no one in particular, no, no particular artist? Uh, so many people. Uh, the Catholic, Catholic iconography, for me, is very important from the Middle Ages, um, you know, to the time of, uh, the time that, that, that the Mudejar, uh, Mudejar um, uh, art that was by uh, the, uh, you know, the Islamics with the uh, Jewish and the Catholics, you know, which is completely goes back to 1400s. Uh, so much of that art um, really resonates with me because it's also very full of layers. And it's also, for me, it's resistance because it's like, you know, they throw you out such an incredible culture, as native to Spain, the Islamics, as Spain is to Spain. And then all of a sudden the Catholic come and they mix it and then it becomes something else, you know. And then the, the Jews are part of that as well. So it, for me, that resonates with what I do because I see America of this great, you know, a stew of things full of layers. So that kind of thing, but no specific artist. I am very much inspired by many people, but I know like more than anything, like movements, political, you know, that's, that's what I am about. So Tris, can you talk a little bit just about your daily life as an artist? Like, you know, how do you, you know, what is your day? Are you going to the studio? Are you working on installations? But also connecting to that, Maybe any advice or inspiration to artists that are coming out of school as a woman, an immigrant, or an artist, or all those categories. Mm -hmm. Like, how have you um, sustained yourself in a way, you know, over 20 years and really things like that? Um, my, you know, everybody has, has to find what works for you. You have to find your way. But and that's why I am not very much into what that's the whole. That's how it has to be done. I am very against that because I've seen that everybody is so different and things work for others, they work for me. Uh, but what I, how I've been able to do it is like, I, for me it's very important to build up community. Okay, I think, and I was talking to you Nelson about that, that it takes a village. You know, everybody that, is part of my life and it's like talking my, my husband, my kids, my sister who are also in the arts. We kind of a team and we try to help each other because I wanted to have it all. Like I wanted to have my profession, I, ha I want to be a mother, I wanted to travel and I, want, I don't have enough money for that. So then you, you know what you have to do is to kind of organize yourself very well, you know, and, and Find the ways to sustain your practice in things that make sense to you. For example, I love teaching. I always, I love people. So that was for me something that made sense, but I never have done it full time. You know, I, uh, I always have done it uh, like part time. And it's been, it been good for me because I also been able to sustain that practice by doing commissions, you know. And so it's kind of like finding uh, these little formulas you know, to, okay, this makes sense. And, and then to sacrifice certain things sometimes because I want to go and spend, you know, a two months uh, in Granada, <laughs> just to working. So, or that, and, and then maybe not able to do it, I have to wait two years because my daughter, you know, is in an age that this is not the time. So all that kind of thing is like, comes to, um, you know, to, to the plate. And, and, but every day how I do my practice, uh, like normally, I think a lot. I walk a lot. Like, a, like I need to exercise because I have too much energy. So, and I live in my head. <laughs> so then I, I, but I think a lot. Like I, I don't imagine myself every single day in the studio, build, you know, making all these things. Like a, I will do like entire show in three months, but it's something that I've been thinking for six months. And then of course, when you go to the studio, the whole six months that you've been thinking changed completely. <laughs> okay, but it, that is my process. You know, that is my process. It, it has worked for me, but I definitely feel that 
I think my team of people around me, they being super important for, for me, you know? Family, friends, um, conversation with artists. How do you do this? And, and oh, I got a good recommendation for you because why don't you do this now? Like we did right now with Daniel and I when we met in uh, Joe Michel Foundation. You know, you become friends with other, other artists, you know, and you build up communities, you know, and you find things in common and you help each other. So that's how I usually, how I manage. You know, one thing is important. You have to be extremely truth to your, to you, <laughs> okay? No, like, oh, this is the way it's done. Don't do anything, like, if you don't feel it, don't go for it. But, I'm gonna tell you, since I, I, I am like, I do installations, I do sculptures, and like things like, oh my God, oh, if, they, if a museum don't, don't if they don't buy at the museums, you know, we have to put in storage, you know, that kind of thing. So. You have to think that maybe it's very good. Pre-making is always good because you can make all these sketches and all the process of these installations. You know, the, all that kind of thing makes a lot of sense of how to be able to sustain that installation practice. And think about Cristo and Jean Claude. That's how they done it. You know, and not only them, but a lot of other people that just don't come to my mind because they, they always come to my mind because it makes so much sense. You know, but like how to. Um, for example, like if you do a installation to make sure you do things that people can acquire. People that are your fan club, but they, cannot, they don't have a, a, a Los Angeles house to put your installation. So always think about uh, to be able to um, adapt, but without losing yourself. It's very important. You know, and also um, things are always changing. This generation, for example, um, there are a lot of good things and a lot of bad things as usual. Now there is a lot of information. And that information, the, the so much information is good and bad. Capitalize on the good part of the good information. You know, there is so much out there. And sometimes at, if you take a job like teaching or, or helping an artist, you know, and then I, I did things like that. You know, think about that all that is going to teach you something, you know, and how you're going to use that experience to advance your career to sustain it, you know, and be organized. Don't play with this idea of like, uh, oh, you know, I am an artist, I forget all the recipes, you know, work on it in, to be organized, you know, that kind of thing. Do you sketch your installations or do you work straight to the material? I do so many drawings. I always do so. And that's why sometimes it, that's like another exhibition because then the installation becomes something else. So yeah, I do a lot of drawings, but I always been like that. I, I, am, I, I, I need, to, I need to, um, to do marks, which is, by the way, very arrogant of me because it's like you want to preserve your ideas, you know, which makes a lot of sense. It's, it's from the caves, you know, from Altamira and all those caves in Europe. The, what do you think? They want to make sure we know the stories. <laughs> so I guess it's the same thing, you know, and, and it's just very important because the, the drawing and the making of these drawings is funny how they clarify so much ideas and they become also another inspiration for something else. Because when you're doing something, you, oh, like you find different, you know, the same way that when you start making it with your hands, like everything changes. Which I think is a great conversation. I think it's close. Is this one another? Question? Yeah, so one quick one, and then I know people in class at six, so I'll okay. get off. So what has been the response from the community? How do they feel? Do they connect to the work? Or? Well, I've been very lucky. I think, because I, um, I, I always try to make sure 
even though, you know, like uh, you, the artists, we have the education in art, we understand each other usually, you know. Uh, we have some codes that we just recognize and we know. I, uh, because I do this kind of research and it's like going to places, to people that are like normal people <laughs> saying that they are knowing the arts, um, I've been able to see, for example, in the case of the lightsabers and the, the uh, video, and these ones, um, how people, when they, you give them a clue, they get it, and how people feel connected, and they start telling you their stories. So in that sense, I think people connect. And in and this moment, for example, there is this exhibition I have at Brick also, where I had the, the big commission of the Mura, that is uh, it's called Bordering the Imaginary. And it's an exhibition about the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And it's been, you know, I don't know if you guys know, but the Dominicans and Haitians, when they start talking about that, people become very passionate. And in the case of this exhibition, it's been beautiful. Because the moment, you know, you, you, everybody understands that our history are intertwined and nobody wants to give you a rule of how to behave. And in this case, the, it, it's very open, the narrative. They're just giving you things, you know, for you to get inspired. I think in the case of that distribution, which can be, it is a, a conflictive for many people. You know, people also from the community, they felt represented. So I guess in that sense, I can say that I've been successful with that. Okay, well, Sharon's allowed to be here for a couple more minutes or questions as well before she comes to, into painting, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you.